Everybody online. Oh, y'all. We are now about to hear about extended buying and opening courses and materials. And we have Eileen Dawn Alexander. Either the preference. It works. All of them work. It's a lovely thing. People can make their own choices. The slides are there. The slide is at a short link. We have a z.umn.edu at the University of Minnesota. And so that's there, followed by the slash and alt C23 slides. Um, and there's another way to get to that. I just want to, before we do that, um, Anne Marie's keynote made me think about the fractal. And I'm definitely talking about something that's a fractal, a small thing that we're doing and going to export to a bigger. So this is genuinely, I wrote in my hand a reminder that it's reflective practice that I'm talking about as we're moving on to next stages. I did open a VVox Q&A, especially if you're online and you want to add something there. So vivox.app and the number is 127-067-566. And I've already populated it with the links, including the slides and um, a course site and a folder that I created as a clone of what I do in person. So. Yeah, this 30 years of technology thing. Um, I, in the middle, that was me as an undergraduate using those lovely, uh, you know, hanging Chad cards. Um, and I ran my first online discussion using a Gandalf box where people could come in one at a time to read and respond. And um, I taught in the uh, first uh, uh, computer classroom at the University of Iowa because my partner developed the room and nobody was signing up to do it. Um, so for Harmony in the House, I did that. But one of the things as I'm thinking about this with OER, Open Educational Resources, I've created them using Press Reader for the most part, and I loved doing that. However, um, I've gotten many requests from people for having um, accessible documents because the document conversion for PDF is difficult. Um, and also we had a really hard time setting that up because the docs came into us in ways that we had to make accessible to put into the press reader system. So I would do so many things differently now. Um, and uh, the format is definitely uh, inclusive and accessible for people who use screen readers. But as my favorite colleague who uses and advises on screen readers says, the rest of us are kind of screwed for accessibility. If you need a printout, you need a Google Doc to highlight and work with. It's really difficult to convert a press book into accessible documents. Somewhere along the way, we also started at the university an initiative called the Seven Course Skills. It's kind of like Sculpt here in the UK, where we teach people how to use alternative text, contrast, headings, links, all of those things. And the pages all give people do's and don'ts. And that was really fun to populate. And at the same time, we've populated it. I notice now it's become about using web pages, designing web pages for screen readers. So it drops out a whole bunch of people with accessibility needs. So it's barriers for people with a variety of accessibility needs. We started to address this last session. They talked about something at Birmingham that they're doing with it is a voluntary 30 minute module. We have a non-voluntary, definitely mandated um, module that's 30 minutes, three components. Um, Minnesota faculty in the whole system, we have five campuses across the state, hate doing mandatory things. We had 3000 people finish it and they're asking for more opportunities to talk and more information. So even when it's com compliance, there's a lot of non-compliance for mandatory things. Um, and we focused on case studies and the follow-up requests were for things like, these resources are really great, but I can't access them. Um, they're behind Canvas and behind something else and the shareable documents with inside were only PDFs, which are a problem for some readers. So um, in doing all this, I realized that one of the things I needed to go back to is thinking about who I do this work with, because my own students were saying, I can actually use your documents. And I have students with all kinds of disabilities and all kinds of factors about their access to technology, people who are sharing computers, people who only have the phone, people who can't ever take their computers out of the research lab and aren't allowed to print in the research lab. So we're trying to figure out how to be connected and care about each other. 
um, in a particular class. This was spring of 2020, and that was the spring that everything changed. So we went online and the students said, can you give us documents that um, are in ways that we can print out, we can download our own copies, we don't have to mess with PDFs, and can you create something we can take away with us to use when we're out of the class and that we can share with our colleagues? So I started making all the documents I had accessible, that two eyes. So they were thinking about how to work with each other and they made the agreement to use all the accessibility guidelines from those seven core skills to do documents for my class, to do documents for each other, to do everything with each other so that it was accessible using the seven core skills and also thinking about access and inclusion as um, conceptual things, things you build into your course. So they had two eyes. They had an eye on where they were and where they wanted to be. Now my students are future faculty. So they know that they're going to have to pay attention to accessibility and say that they do, and they're gonna to have to create documents and that they're eventually gonna to have to create open access documents, open educational resources. But I really wanted them to have the skills so they weren't dealing with things like I was, like converting everybody's jumbled up documents into something that could be a press reader. So I looked at where they needed to be and so did they. And that was really lovely. Um, and I went back at the same time to look at um, uh, Cofield and Edwards who talk their um, article is best practice. What's next? Perfect practice. They get at the idea of we can't, there isn't a best that things are mutable and adjustable. Who says it's a best practice? What's the evidence? What's the criteria? So I started thinking about that. I've always pushed against best practice and I at least get people to go with effective practice if they're going to use one of those things and thought, what can I do that's breaking and asking for whom, best for whom, what are the criteria and what conditions by looking at my teaching, which I'd already done, and you have access to my course. It's in the notes field for these um, slides. Um, so when you download them, you'll be able to see a clone of the course. Um, I do it in the assessment. I'll say a bit about that. I have the students think about how they interact with each other and share documents with each other. And I do this in professional development with faculty. Um, so far, I've impacted 250 students, 50 faculty, and in our online course design site where we brought all of this in during the um, tumult and the turnaround, we had 800 faculty. So it's had a nice run of people trying this out and thinking about accessifying is, if you're gonna do something that's open education and you're gonna publish it, how do you start out doing it in a way that's shareable? So for example, the Google Doc can become the Word Doc, can become the PDF. If you go from a Google Doc to a PDF, it's not gonna be accessible and most PDFs aren't fully accessible. Um, as I work with my colleague Khaled, who, who, who helps people um, to create them. So thinking about all of that, I really came back to this idea that uh, we're in a system and even when we're paying attention to accommodations, we're still in an ableist system in academics. Anyone who needs something beyond someone who's visually or physically impaired must have some sort of deficit. And I push against that as someone who's disabled. I have a learning disability, I have physical disabilities. And when this was really happening, I lost the sight in one of my eyes because of a protein cloud. So I had trouble reading. Dyspraxic me needs to print out things, needs to make comments. And if you've all tried making comments and keeping notes on a PDF, it's not the easiest thing in the world. Google Docs is much easier. So is a paper copy that you can turn into a PDF if you really wanna have it. But I need that in order to work effectively as a learner. So it really made me think about how I was adding to ableism by not paying attention to what my students were asking of me and helping them to become the teachers they wanted to be. So also then, um, Alistair McNaught is one of my favorite human beings. And um, I got a bunch of people to join in with me in doing this because one person can't do it. And there was this you know, disability team, the specialists, the document conversion folks who are overwhelmed. So overwhelmed that when I said, will you teach me the skills that you have, they did because I could do it for my own students. But we started realizing who all is involved in this. There's a Disability Resource Center. There's a Center for Teaching, our Academic Technology Center, our um, Office for Equity and Diversity, our Graduate School, our International um, Student Support. And we're all losing staff. So we realized we had to figure out how to work together for something effective to teach people how to do this 
so that the students and the future faculty and the current faculty were actually producing the accessible documents and starting from the get-go. Um, so using that, I started thinking about design, which is my favorite thing to think about in the world, um, and with accessibility inclusion. And we had done a seminar, five-part seminar on teaching with access and inclusion using some of these ideas. And again, trying to get faculty to think about what's the small change that you can make. And it can be creating Google Docs. It can be um, doing document conversion. It can be something small and what's its big impact. So one of the things we thought about in there is the inclusive part versus the accessible part. Often inclusive is technical um, adaptability and the other one is more um, attitudinal, the inclusive part. How do we do this con contextual change? What happens? Yes, I can technically satisfy things by making PDFs that are available to a screen reader, but not all screen readers do that. But I also want to do the more approachable thing of how to make it inclusive that's more adaptable, that um, people can adapt to their own needs. So this is my friend Khaled's slide. Um, and Khaled has been my constant partner in this, um, even to the point of, you know, when you do a hyperlink, you're supposed to hyperlink the whole article title if you're doing an article. Colette and I have devised a system where we, at the end, say it opens as a PDF or as a Google Doc and hyperlink what it opens as. Um, and that's partly because my eyes stuff means the blue hurts. So I don't like look at my own pages with all the blue. But again, that's adaptive. And we're trying to figure out how to do it and signal that it's okay. And I tell my students that at the beginning of the semester, if they're used to something else, this is what you'll encounter. And we started with design instead of asking the, you know, aims, what are your aims? I use aims for outcomes, objectives, all those things. We started asking questions. How will we work together? Instead of, you know, where, what's our context? How will we work together became the thing. And for working together with visually impaired students, with hearing impaired students, with students with multiple co-occurring disabilities, we need to think about how to do that work together slightly differently. So even with videos, I can see a video, I can read the captions. I cannot understand when I'm looking at it on the screen, I need a transcript. So for podcasts and videos, I make a transcript available and put the link to the um, vlog or the video or the podcast within that. But asking that question, and I call this the four A's and I based it on Biggs and Tang, and a little bit on um, the backward design stuff. So, you know, what is it students want, will learn? And my classes, undergrad as well as grad, they're gonna learn how to create accessible materials and share them with each other and how to do a step up. So we down platform a little bit, but then they can up platform to an infographic, to an ebook, to other kinds of things because they've created the document. And then also how will they practice that learning? So, um, my students in the big class I do create a syllabus and they practice their learning of accessibility by creating a word document syllabus. Their assessment is to look at that in terms of how did they use the seven core skills and the teaching with access and inclusion ideas and how would they up platform it? So how would you use an infographic with it as an intro? And would you create a transcript for that infographic if you were doing that? How would you do it on Canvas if you wanted a Canvas setup? So that becomes their assessment where they can, it's evidence of their learning and they're demonstrating how they would do it. So I use this to rethink my courses and try to start formalizing it, which is what this year is about. I also did it because learning, and this is from um, James Zoll, again, citations are in my notes field, who talks about us gathering data and often in academic spaces, we gather data and then we go right to testing it, right? And gathering is sensory as well as cognitive. So when that sensory information comes in, if you're feeling left out and the morning keynote took on some of that, you don't feel like you belong um, if you can't access the course materials. So there's a distress and a shutting down, this low level traumas. But if you can see yourself in it, you pick it up and start to think about, oh, this is, this is what I do and I can create it in a different mode as well. So then both reflecting and creating get open and people can test it out. So my students have the goal of using accessible materials. They reflect on it in their assignments. They do different things. They create their final projects and they test it out with their peers all the time. 
So we're trying to use all of those things and build the associations that inclusion is big and good. Um, and the ways, another way of looking at this comes from a place called UDL Online, who says, uh, they point out that you need to separate the means from the ends. The end is an accessible course, but how people get there, could it be a syllabus? Could it be a Canvas page that has all the files in all the right places? Could it be something else? So for my syllabus, for my students, they have to do the paper version because that's the starting place. But then they get to go in and tell me how they're actually going to use it. Um, and they learn some new accessibility skills along the ways, along the way. Um, here's just a quick little look at um, the student part that we do. Um, I think what's interesting is that I start with learning so that they're not thinking about people with disabled disabilities or disabled folks or um, less than sorts of things, but learning is like this. Learning needs guidance. And um, one of the things with this particular question from um, Stephen Chu is the answer is actually the time you spend studying. And he amplifies that by saying you have an orienting task. So you're gonna do this assignment to learn more about learning and how it works, but also to think about how to convey that to your learners in different ways. So we spend four weeks talking about learning. How does that impact what you design and the kinds of learners you'll have? First generation, BIPOC, our acronym for um, Black, Indigenous, and people of color generally. So they're really thinking about who's there and they look in the classroom because pretty much by this point, all of my students have outed themselves with disabilities, even the ones who aren't officially declared with disabilities at the university or who were just diagnosed as I was in PhD school. So well, there's been a lot of talk about doing this and support. We heard the students say we need support to learn how to do this in that panel. So I do three guidance documents for drafting a syllabus and the support is there. Um, what resources to use, how to use them, what to look for, both in terms of the syllabus and also the accessibility skills. And they do those some practice assignments where they try things out along the way. Um, by doing these uh, drafting along the way. And this is, you know, one of the ways I start to talk to them about it is you start to do it, you learn and apply the core skills. They apply to syllabus texts in these particular ways, using headings, hyperlinks, margins, and white space. Um, I actually do turn back the first time I get a syllabus draft that has margins smaller than an inch all the way around. Um, and does has single spacing because that's not visually appealing. So it's my introduction to them about visual scan matters as much as a screen reader scan. Your eyes need to move and there need to be cues. So we have some consistent texts and they know that from the beginning. And they've already used them for some assignments. It's contract grading. So my students, I used to have the last B item listed as the A item for a, a, a grade that they had to use the core skills. After three classes said, no, no, everybody needs to create an accessible syllabus document and use those skills and think about what it means because everything we do in our career means that we know how to do an accessible document going forward especially if we're gonna up platform build on it. So they helped me to revise this and have it being that they have to also use principles of teaching with access and inclusion in the design of the course and reflect on that, reflect that in their document and talk about it in their self-assessment tool. Um, and I tell that to ongoing classes and um, say, what do you think about that? And they are very happy because they can take out stuff in their portfolios that nobody else has. And they can also go back to their departments and have some leverage for saying to their faculty, I need more accessible materials, accessible materials that are more accessible. So um, faculty get changed, get prompted to change because of their grad students. So one other thing here then is this is a quick look at the uh, memo that they do. It's uh, several items, but the part on accessibility is they have to do the Likert scale, but also really think about this, what do you do? And that ends up being, it's the last uh, narrative question. They give themselves a grade. Um, they talk, they write a comment about the grade. They talk about the strength of their syllabus, where they're working on next, and then they do this. Um, the grade and the comment on the grade are one item. 
Um, and often when they get to this part, they've given themselves an A because they've learned how to do an accessible syllabus. And if they hadn't, they think they wouldn't be passing. B is you know, barely passing for a graduate student in the US. So these have been really self-revelatory for them in a lot of ways too. And so finally, you know, I'm gonna come back to Alistair. That's not only about expertise in technology or disability, it's about expertise in communicating without barriers. And one of the ways I've been able to work on this is we do have a village of people who are interdisciplinary, um, in, um, diverse, uh, um, they're intercampus. All of our campuses work together. They're interprofessional. And that has made a big difference because we're not specialists. It's not limited to specialists. We all learn how to do it. And it's about communicating without barriers becomes the piece that students take back to their faculty and to their own students when they say, now here's how you're going to do your assignments. I have three former students I continue to work with in co-writing and co-teaching, and they all have their students do the same production of accessible materials. That feels like a win. And then even more in this, it's really that thing of a climate where the networks of accessibility inclusion are really important. Peers create accessible materials for each other, the learners and the teachers, the learners in their learning spaces. We try to figure out how to do accessibility in the spaces. And also, what if the resources I'm providing them aren't fully accessible? Um, a web page is not my friend Khaled's favorite thing. I turn them into Google Docs and get permission to do that so he doesn't have to navigate the ads. The recommended articles are not my best friend's favorite thing on a Chronicle of Higher Education page because he's ADHD and he'll go into each and every one of those rabbit holes. But with a Google Doc, he doesn't. He stays where it is and he can, because I leave the other articles at the bottom, he can choose to go there. So this is just a first page of my own current syllabus as I go into the next semester, which started on Tuesday this week. Um, and it's a place where I try to walk the talk and that's available to you as well um, for taking a look at what we do in this teaching and higher education course. Um, this also the other one called teaching for learning. But for making it open educational materials, the part is, what can we do to down platform so that people have the skills so they can up platform? And I've been really happy with how they've thought about accessibility when they move to, you know, prettier versions of what they're doing. So that's it and me talking really fast. Yay. Queries, questions, conundrums, experiences. Challenges, anything like that? So in that time, I'm trying to do a lender in the best society. And we, uh, there was a resource exchange um, a few years ago, right, so pre-2018, we basically did a lot of one, mm -hmm. um, which was uh, a simulation of a uh, Thomas lab space. And at the time, um, the person that created this, uh, just given this manual, and said, turn this into a new type of resource. Um, which did brilliant this work. And the uh, academic that um, commissioned that is now asking for us to release it as uh, OER stuff. And I've done a lot of work in the last few years around accessibility, and I'm looking at it thinking, okay, this is, but it wasn't designed to be accessible. And, but we have PS bar in 2018, um, so that's the uh, public services body of accessibility regulation. So anything that we look at or change um, from one format to another has to be recreated in an accessible way. And part of it is that again, is this the right, uh, as much as we may want to do it, it's a chunk of work. Is a huge this beast that would need a complete re redesign, re um, imagining of the structure and also those different elements, the base parts to be accessible by design, then build that into your component. Is it the top structure of learning? I can't remember what the book is about accessible. You know, you have to start with accessibility, accessibility step four. 
put those bits up and um, kind of what you were saying about the uh, the down platforming and the up platforming oh it it feels like makes your head want to explode yeah but I think that's because I appreciate the volume of work that would be required to turn that into an accessible resource I think that's what it is you know, just before you answer that, and I'm sorry to interrupt. That's all right. I, I, I'm just going to, I need to give you my prejudice because I go, and it's because I can't read yeah. a spreadsheet properly. I hate spreadsheets. All my time, though. So it's not because I don't find it interesting, because I really love the presentation. And I can wish you well. Well, you're, you're still here for a minute. I mean, one thing that I've, I, so I'm redesigning our website on course design, and it's going to be a course in syllabus design, and it has to model the accessibility stuff we've been talking about. And Charlotte, the woman who's doing the web part of it, is a little alarmed about how to do that. So one of the things, because our web pages do not print out pretty, um, no matter what she's tried, the Drupal format, the US pick, just do not print out pretty. Things overlap and look. Um, so our small changes for all the pages that are core ideas, there's going to be a click to um, a Google document that will be instead of at the end where it says, you know, you can put the word where there's edit in your version, you put the word copy in, and then you paste that URL in, which makes them download it to their own computer. Um, so we're going to do that for everything that we think is foundational because we can't do it all right now. But everything that's foundational, and if they have a diagram, yeah, right, yeah. right, and if we have a, a, a diagram in there, that can be in there alt texted in a way that someone who's not using an alt text reader, so me, I like checking the alt text out because I usually learn something more. I can do that too. So that's our first small step is to say what's foundational here that we need to make that available as a Google Doc and download so they don't mess with it, and so um, it will live in a in the uh, unit space, not on my computer. They'll take it on so that when I leave, it doesn't leave with me. Yeah. Thanks, Sue. Sorry, I'm I apologize. No such thing as stupid. Please At least we have the door that works. Yeah. Is it the course is it primarily faculty that's taking it? No, it's all graduate students. So unlike a PGR cert where it might be faculty, it's all yeah. graduate students and some postdocs. Um, and faculty can take, we set up seminars for them, right. like the five week, the five session teaching with access and inclusion, or we also did five weeks for the online course design. Going to be teaching. No. Well, they want to be teachers in faculty life. Yeah. They, yeah. And um, some of them are also taking it because they know that in mentoring, they're actually teaching. So we have a school of public health and a plant biology program that require it. Everyone who's a graduate student, whether they're going to teach or not, because they are going to be mentoring in labs and because they're going to be teaching undergraduates how to do the lab work. So they're required to do it as well. Mm -hmm. um, and we also get a fair number of international students who are learning how to teach in the U.S. context and want to take those um, practices home. And often they're the ones who are most um, welcoming of the inclusion and the accessibility pieces because they feel so excluded at home, um, sometimes unsafe at home. Um, so they want to learn how to do things here to feel safe and so their students can feel safe. So it is almost all graduate students and it's tuition driven. Um, and they have a tuition band as we call it until they do their, um, pass their exams until they become ABD. Um, so right before they write their dissertation, all that time period, they have a tuition band that's available for them to take courses. Okay. So for the most part, it's paid for through their programs. Um, and the one credit one that you have the syllabus for is our compromise for when people are at the end of that, there's usually just like one credit left. So we did that to get them in. Um, faculty also have a program called Early Career, which they attend. Um, when I did it, it was six big sessions. It's now four because of being online. And then they meet with peer groups six times and do some of the same work. 
So we're trying to get it there and we're trying to get it into the things our academic technology department does as well. Yeah. Where they feel a little less confident telling faculty what to do. Um, and we don't at the Center for Teaching, just because I think because we're teachers too. Yeah. So in terms of the, um, like the content money going in, the Google Docs and everything else, do you have, um, I want to call it like a safety check on the plane, like a process you go through just to double check or be aware of bits and pieces before you then decide to share it out into the world, like like license checks, and or is that kind of all happen before? <laughs> so for the for the syllabuses that we share as examples like that, um, um, we do the permission thing, and I'm working on that right now to get permissions for sharing right. them out in the world. Um, and most of the graduate students, all very few of them, do the thing of saying, "Please don't share this within the course courses you teach," because um, it feels very much like a peer to peer, even though they're not in the same section. So right. they're good with it being shared. Um, across sections and I always have to put in a note that says you have permission to use this and you can show your print version to somebody if you want to do that or show somebody your screen you do not have permission to share this in any public space and I'm going to have to trust you on that um, so it's um, it, we don't have an open license on those we haven't done anything with that because there isn't really one that says yeah you can share it but not outside mm -hmm. this circle yeah. um, so I've done it that way and we will put um, all of the stuff that we're working on, like when I finish the public facing course, it will be all um, attribution and everybody will have given permission either for a whole syllabus or a segment. Um, and within the course the two, they work in small groups and they agree to share with that, but beyond their small groups, they um, let me know if they're willing to have other people look at their syllabus even in the course. Um, what I noticed with grad students, there's not a lot of protective of, they're not protecting their intellectual property in the same way faculty are. Right. They want yeah. they wanted open access and they want open yeah. access yeah. publication and they want that piece. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And for them to say, I have a couple of undergraduates whose stuff I'm including and that's huge for them too. Um, you know, my, my material is featured in this, in this resource. It's a good thing. Yeah, we we're digitizing our what they call content release agreements. Mm -hmm. um, so they're going into a much easier format to use uh, through this week. Um, that is digital. And um, we're looking at, well, we'll need to look at it in more detail, uh, the Creative Commons structure stuff. Um, <laughs> and I have to get it. For the exact, <laughs> I'm moving something else out. Yeah. And I have to get ours approved by general counsel. So that's one of the things that slowed me down. I was hoping to have the site done. It's like, oh, right. I have to go to general counsel to make sure that my form is correct. We've never had to do that before, but because it's the provost's office, our registrar's office, they want to make sure that it's. Yeah, we've been doing more and more legal team. Yeah. yeah. Not that it's deliberately slow, but. But it, it's, it's the thing, isn't it? But it's also like IRB. I want there to be a fast track for the um, the legal stuff as there is for institutional review. We have a fast track and we always get fast tracked, but not the legal stuff. Thanks for hanging out. Thank you very much. Yeah.